Aren't you glad that knowing you as well as you know you, and we're going to dwell with this a lot today, not only our actions, but our thoughts, aren't you glad that the Lord loves you anyway? He knows all those things about you you never want anybody else to know. And he loves us anyway. Oh, my goodness. And you've heard me say this. Uh, in most kingdoms, the subjects are required to offer their lives for the king, if that's what it takes. In our kingdom, the Lord's kingdom, what? Our king gave his life for us. Oh, how he loves us. All right, today we finally come to the 10th commandment found in Exodus 20:17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. America's advertising industry is a multi-billion dollar industry and has been for a long time, and here's why. It's been successful at spreading an epidemic throughout our nation, and the disease is called the I wants. I want. I stood in the checkout line at Walmart this past Tuesday, and you know how they have all those last minute impulse items on both sides. And right in front of me, there was a young mother getting her last minute Thanksgiving stuff, and she had two little girls. One was about four, one was about two. The two year old's in the basket, the other four year old was a little tornado. You know, moving among mama's feet and back and forth between both sides of that narrow checkout aisle in front of me. I'm just watching her. Moving back and forth between those colorful items, just grabbing one after another and reaching and putting it in her mama's cart while her mama's trying to put everything out of the cart onto the checkout stand. And she's going, Mama, I want. Mama, I want. You all have experienced it, many of you. You've lived it. You know what I'm talking about. You've experienced it. On TV, we see a product advertised, this new car or toy or latest iPhone or computer or video game, the latest fashion. How much money you can save by switching to Geico. And if you're not careful, we become infected ourselves with the I wants. I want that. But the advertising industry's job isn't just to create the need within us to have their product, but also to get our minds thinking along the terms of, you know what, I deserve this. Think about it. If you go home and you watch TV tonight after church, you go home and you watch, say, three hours, how many times are you going to hear this on commercials? Get the such and such you deserve. That's the words that's been being passed out now for the last several years in the advertising industry. You deserve this. Get the free such and such you deserve. Get the best such and such that you deserve. Now, though the perception is that until we get that new thing, whatever it is, we're not going to be happy. And that when we get that new thing, we will finally be happy. The truth of the matter is that even if we do get that new thing, it's not going to bring us happiness for very long. You see that, parents. We've seen that in grandparents illustrated on Christmas morning. How many times? How many times? You know, by the end of the day, that new thing is pushed aside. Surveys tell us that many marriages are miserable and countless others break up, not because of sex, not because of the children or the in-laws, but because of the things, the possessions, or our attitude toward the money that's spent within the marriage to get all the stuff we think we deserve. And the two spouses, you know, collide on those desires. Now, there's something very obvious out there that many of you have already noticed and I've mentioned before. Many couples that get married today expect to have within three to five years what? what it took their parents a lifetime to accumulate. And they get those things more often than not through credit, through the God of credit, those things they think they deserve. I counsel couples all the time that are getting married to avoid credit cards at all cost. Even that card, well, we're just going to have one for emergencies. Uh, <laughs> it's amazing what can be an emergency. You know, first of all, my goodness, Christmas snuck up on me. I wasn't prepared. And then it's somebody's birthday, and, you know, I just don't have the money. Well, this is an emergency. And next thing you know, that emergency, you know, that, that, that debt is stacked up. And how did this happen? And debt adds stress to relationships because it causes marriages to go down in the flames of bankruptcy till debt do us part. 
That's the swan song of many marriages today. So until we can learn to do without certain things, we can do without them, and we don't deserve <laughs> everything that we think we deserve, we're never going to learn to be content. We're just not. Though today's message focuses on the tenth and final of God's commandments, the message today could also be titled, The Secret to Satisfaction. A philosopher once said, to whom little is not enough, get this, to whom little is not enough, nothing will ever be enough. The Bible says, you shall not covet. What does that mean? To covet means to have an unlawful desire for that which is not rightfully yours. To covet or to desire that which is not yours is not just limited to money, we know that. It could mean that you covet influence, fame, popularity, power, or to have good looks, you know, like Jim Paddock, you know, or super talent like Jim Paddock, you know. Maybe those are things that you'd like, a great mind like his. You can covet your neighbor's salary, their education, their house, their car, their land, even, even their family. There are lots of, boy, I wish I had a family like so-and-so's family. Oh, my goodness. You can cover their, their yard, their garden, their motorhome, their boat. You wish you could go on as many vacations or as cru many cruises as they, they go. How do they do that? You, know, you, want, you wish you could do that. You get the idea. Now, listen, it's not wrong to have uh, desires and ambitions as long as they're lawful and good desires. When God saves you, he doesn't neuter your heart and mind and take away your passion for life. In fact, it's God who gives you the wisdom and the ability to obtain wealth and good things lawfully within your lifetime. James 1.17, I, I mentioned this first Sunday night at the community Thanksgiving service. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. God knows that you want to love. He knows that you want to be loved. You have a God-given desire for friends and happy uh, home, success, victory, peace. Everybody wants those things. He knows that. You're wired to have those things. Those things are not wrong, but it's the unlawful desire of coveting others' success. Those things that they have is what we're talking about. You know, God blesses hard work. God blesses preparation. God blesses thought that has been put into things. God intends that we prepare and build for the future. He, he intends for those things to happen. But why is this the last command of the ten? Because it sums up all the others? It's not just a coincidence. It's like God's, oh yeah, and this, and added it on. Uh-uh. All the previous nine commands dealt with, get this, action. Our action. Our deeds. But this command deals with what? Attitude. The thoughts. The desires of the heart. The first nine dealt with the deeds. This one with the desires. You see, until we learn to master the desires of our hearts, the other commands are going to make us miserable as we try to keep them. We can't. We're going to be miserable trying to keep them. The Ten Commandments are, once again, they're given to us to show God's standard of holiness. Remember, I, I say it's like a, a sign at the beginning of an amusement park on a ride. You know, this is how high you got to be, this is how tall you got to be to ride. You know, we all used to see those signs. Sometimes they still have them in different parks, Frontier City, Six Flags. You know, whenever, if you saw one at the entrance to heaven, this is how good you've got to be, how righteous you've got to be to enter here. Nobody measure up. The Bible says we all fall short. We can't get there on our own goodness, our own Holiness. God gave us the Ten Commandments to show, you want to know what holy is? Here's what holy is. The opposite of holiness is selfishness, coveting. That's what the opposite of it is. Very few people even realize that they're coveting when they're doing it. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, great preacher of the 1800s, said this, you know, I've seen thousands of people saved, thousands of people converted, but I've never seen a covetous person converted. What? He was saying that of all the testimonies you hear from people about, well, I'm so glad God saved me from this. I realized I was doing this. I was doing... Very few people have you ever heard say, you know, I realized how covetous I was. How much I just desired everybody else's stuff. How I wanted this. I wasn't, I wasn't content with my life. Very few people you ever hear of anybody say that is why they got saved. Until we discover and we admit what our real problem is, 
these altars remain empty. The, the church pews remain half full, and we just keep flowers over there on top of the, you know, our seasonal arrangements on top of the baptistry until people realize what their real problem is and are willing to confess it and admit it. Remember young Apostle Paul, he was an up-and-comer, had everything going for him. He's a Pharisee. He was praised. He was petted. He was admired. He was being groomed for great things. He had the proper birth. He had nobility. He had a name. He had education. He had status. People respected him. He could speak several different languages. He had it all. And one day, Paul was taking a survey of himself. You ever done that yourself? He's taking a survey of himself, and he started ticking off the Ten Commandments, realizing how good he was. You shall have no other gods before me. Of course not. No idols. Not in my house. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. I'd never. Honor your father and your mother. Yes. Remember the Sabbath. Always. Don't kill. Don't, don't commit adultery. Don't steal or give false testimony. Yes, yes, yes. He was doing fine, he said. But then came the commandment number 10. And Paul said, I had not known sin until I got this commandment. He said, for I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. That's another reason why the Lord gave us the Ten Commandments, to help us realize what sin is. You think you're doing pretty good until you start looking at the Ten Commandments. Going, and then Jesus takes it a step further when he says, not only these actions, but the spirit of it. Thinking about it, your thoughts. We'll get there in a few moments. But this final law knocked the breath out of Paul. Even if he could say that he had not broken any of the first nine commandments by actions, he could not say that he hadn't wanted to. He'd wanted to break them. He'd, he'd had sinful desires within his heart. He knew it. Paul knew that he had coveted. James 2.10 says this, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just what? One point is guilty of what? Breaking all of it. Now, there are a lot of people in jail today for doing something wrong. Now, you got people in there that have uh, uh, committed armed robbery, but they're not guilty of murder, but they're still a lawbreaker, and they're still in jail. This is what he's talking about right here. Jesus pointed out in the Sermon on the Mount what Paul later talked about in Romans 7. He said, Jesus said, our hearts and our minds have to be engaged in the pursuit of holiness. You want to be holy? You got to be actively seeking it. He said in Matthew 5, 27 through 28, get this, the words of Jesus. You've heard that it was said, don't commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Works the other way too, ladies. Mercy, think about it. Wow, I mean, so you decide to keep the law of God, but you also have to keep the spirit of the law in the attitude of your heart and mind, or you've broken it just the same. I didn't steal my neighbor's self-propelled lawnmower, but just wishing it was mine, I was coveting. The same as stealing. That's the high standard of holiness. And like we were talking about this morning, Bill, we can't keep it. We can't do it. The Lord also showed us, he gave us the Ten Commandments to show us what? We cannot keep the law on our own. We need a Savior. I've golfed with a lot of rough characters over the years. Some knew I was a preacher, some didn't know, some didn't care. You know, of all the people I golf with, those are the ones I usually like to golf with the most, the ones who didn't care, because they weren't going to act any differently around me. You know, you've heard me say that. I know Christy always gets a kick out of that. You know, I said, one of the things I really appreciated about this church family whenever I became a part of it years ago was, you know, whenever I'd walk into a room and people are talking, they didn't change the way they were talking. They didn't change their behavior. Oh, the preacher's here. You know, I said, they just kept acting as raunchy as they ever did. I said, that's great. I'd rather just be yourself. Don't change. Don't be a hypocrite. Be who you are. And that's what I liked about some of those fellows I'd golf with. Their language could get pretty colorful when that little white ball didn't go where they wanted it to go. Now, I've had my share of pretty bad shops, but I've tried to keep my composure when it happens. One fellow even told me once, you know, preacher, golfing brings out the worst in me, you know, as he was sipping his beer and, and playing. And, and he says, but you know, you seem to keep it all together. 
You don't say bad words. You don't throw your clubs like the rest of us do. And he could throw his pretty hard and far. But I said, no, but have you ever noticed that when I do hit a bad shot and I spit on the grass, the grass doesn't grow there anymore. Sometimes we're pretty good at holding things in. Maybe they didn't bubble up all the way to the surface. You didn't take the Lord's name in vain. But did you want to? Maybe you didn't commit adultery, but did you think about it? Maybe you didn't steal or kill or, or stay at home from church that Sunday, but did you want to? Did you covet evil desires in your heart? Every single one of us have. Everybody in this room. And nothing is more debasing and demonstrates our depravity more than being covetous. <laughs> and you can always go right back to the words of Jesus. Mark chapter 7. Jesus said, for from within, out of our hearts, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, folly. That covers all of us. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. Our thoughts can make us as sinful as our deeds. And one can lead to another if you dwell on it long enough. A man isn't a murderer because he commits murder. He commits murder because he is a murderer. A man's not a liar because he tells a lie. He tells a lie because he is a liar. These things come out of us. They're already there. Covetousness was born in us. Where did we get it? You and I were born with our sinful nature that was given to us from our spiritual father, the devil. Last week I shared with you where Jesus told the unsaved religious leaders, he said, you know what? You're of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father, you will do. He just told them the way it was. And these are the religious people. Now the devil is covetous. It says the devil coveted the throne of God. From the moment he opened his eyes after being created, I imagine he stood there and went, whoa, look at me. I am amazing. I, he says he's the most beautiful thing God ever created. He looked at himself. He was enamored with himself. Who used to talk like that? Oh, <laughs> Jerry Clower. He was enamored of himself. And he said he wanted to be like the Most High. I will become like the Most High. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. He wanted to go higher than God. You and I inherited our sinful nature from him. He gave it to Adam. We inherited it. It's been passed on. This more than likely has happened to you when you were little. You may not remember it, but you were about two years old, and you were sitting in the middle of the floor playing with about ten different toys. Your mama's neighbor came over, brought her two-year-old, and sat that two-year-old down with you and your toys while they shared a cup of coffee. Now that friend of yours, that little two-year-old, reached for one of your toys. You still had the other nine, but what suddenly was the toy you wanted? What was the most precious toy suddenly? The one that two-year-old friend of yours reached out and you stood up, you walked over, and you bopped that poor little kid on the head because he had the toy you decided you wanted above all the others. That is covetousness. We're born with it. Little children are selfish. The first sounds out of their many of their precious little baby mouths are cries of selfishness. Many of their first words are me, mine. I've heard that a lot. And I want. <laughs> the nature of a child is to hold on to what they get. And it might be kind of funny when they're little. We can smile and go, yeah, that's the way they are. But it's not so funny whenever it goes on into the teen years, is it? Or when it goes on into the adult years. We still know people like that. Maybe there are some that are in here. It's not funny anymore. Charles Kingsley said, if you wish to be miserable, listen, if you want to be miserable, think about yourself, about what you want, about what you like, what respect you think others ought to be paying to you, and then to you, you know what? Nothing will be pure. You're going to spoil everything you touch. You'll make misery for yourself out of everything good. You'll be as miserable and wretched as you choose. What's that song? Let's talk about me. me you know. Self-centeredness is another name for covetousness. Mentioned that to you guys this morning. 
survey after survey has shown that most people equate what they have with who they are. I mean, you, you meet somebody new and pretty soon you ask them, what do you do? Because what do we do? We think, we associate who we are with what we do or with what we have. Our money, our power, our jobs, the possessions, they define who we really are. And if we lose everything in our own eyes, if not in the rest of the world, we consider ourselves to be losers. This is why so many people took their lives in the, the stock market crash in 1929 and other crashes when things go bad, great depressions. And that's why people still take their lives today. They've lost something that they valued above all other things. And they've measured the value of their life against that thing, and they decided life was no longer worth living. Some of you have considered suicide. In a group this size, some of you have. At some point or another, if it wasn't a chemical imbalance, it was some, something that had happened to you or something that you lost. Life's no longer worth living if I just can't have that thing in my life. If you want to measure your real worth, then see if you can add up everything that you have that money can't buy. So add those things up and that death can't take away. The things money can't buy and that death can't take away. You'll find your worth there. Those are the things that are, that are priceless. Sometimes you see after a, a tornado or a hurricane or a flood or something, you see people standing in the ruins and somebody puts a microphone in front of their face asks, what are you feeling? What are you feeling? And very often you see people, hey, and they grab their, their kid or their spouse or their dog or something. I've got all I need. I've got everything that's important. All this other stuff's just stuff. It took this to help me to realize all this is just stuff we have. And they got their family. They say, this is what we need. This is what's worth the most right there. What's most important to you? It doesn't take long during a disaster to see what's important. The stuff that's gone or their lives and the lives of their families. I've also seen people stand there going, it's all gone. It's over. You know, it's not worth it. It's all over. It's all. Listen carefully to the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 6. He says, because this is what we're trying to get across today, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For listen, we brought nothing into the world. We can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we're going to be content with that. People who want to get rich, he says, fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. People have misquoted this for years. They say money is the root of evil. Is that what it said? The love of money is the root of evil. All kinds of it. Some people, he says, eager for money, have wandered from the faith. They've pierced themselves with many griefs. And it's not just them. Their whole family, everybody they come in contact with can be affected. All we really need, food, clothes, a place to lay our heads at night. Children need some extra needs. Older folks need some extra needs. The Lord meets our needs. There's nothing wrong with wealth that's been gained honestly and appropriately, but the Bible says that when we set our hearts on just being rich someday, we covet, and we're going to fall into many snares and temptations. You're going to wander from the faith because you're going to put that in front of your relationship with God. And many folks step over family members, friends, co-workers to get what they want. It can happen at school as well. To get what you want whether it's the best grade, to be the valedictorian, to be the star athlete, to be the best cheerleader, to be the most popular, the one that's going to win prom king or queen or whatever. I'm going to do whatever I got to get to get there. And I don't care. As long as I get that, get that trophy. You know what? It's been, what, three weeks now since the Cubs won the World Series? You know what? Eh. Hey, I'm glad they did in my lifetime, but you know what? That doesn't, the sun came up the next day whether they won it or not. You know, and my life was not built over whether the Cubs were going to win the World Series or not. Ask the person who climbs over everybody and anything in their way to get whatever it is they want. As they lay dying, was it worth it? Where are all your friends now? Where's your family now? The ones that you hurt along the way. Are these that are standing next to your bedside, if there are any, are they sincerely sorry to see you go? 
You can't even take what you spent your life gathering with you. They leave this earth just as they came with what? Nothing. The very thing they desired most didn't bring him happiness or peace. Read the book of Proverbs, you'll see about that. He talks a lot about this. Remember Kendrick Perkins? Nancy loved Kendrick. You know, well, he's playing for the Thunder, big man there in the center until a couple years ago. When he was still playing for the Thunder, Channel 4 did an interview with his wife and asked him, what's it like to be married to a wealthy NBA basketball player? So I watched that. And she mentioned a few good things that it had brought, like a bigger house, nicer clothes, some bigger bank accounts. She said there were also a lot of drawbacks that came with all that money. He said they had to learn to not just throw the money around like there was no end to it because in just a couple, three more years or so, Kendrick wasn't going to be playing for the NBA anymore. He's going to get too old and those big paychecks are going to stop. That was going to be the end of that. So they were already teaching their children about the dangers that having a lot of money can bring to the family. There were people calling them. Can you imagine people calling them every single day from this charity or that organization or, or people that they didn't even know they were related to asking them for money for this or for that? I mean, you have more than you can use anyway. He said, that got to really be a burden. I mean, who's really your friend and who's just around as long as you have money to spend? I came away from that interview actually feeling sorry for a multimillionaire. I really did. Be careful for what you desire. We've got to choose our priorities wisely. And the Word of God will help you set those priorities. This is why Satan wants to keep you out of here. He wants to keep you away from here. He wants to keep you out of here at all costs because the spirit of life opens your eyes to the truth and helps you set priorities that will help your life to be healthy and your family to be healthy. It will help you in those areas. Seeking Christ first. What did Jesus say in Matthew 6, Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things. All these things, your actual needs are going to be met. They're going to be given to you as well. Either God's first, or money, or something else. Jesus makes it very clear. You cannot serve two masters. You're always going to put one above the other. Gone with the Wind was on Thanksgiving Day. Anybody watch that? And uh, like Scarlett O'Hara, remember at one time she shakes her fist and she says, Never again will I be poor. Never again. She made it her life's goal to be rich, to never want again. Then you become covetous and you break the other nine commandments at the same time. How did her life, as the a, as a film, as the camera's fading away, how was it going? <laughs> Not real well. You've made riches your idol. You've placed God's name second to the dollar, and you've placed riches over your family. I mean, why do people end up committing murder, adultery, stealing, lying? Covetousness. Did they set out years before intending to be that way? No. That wasn't your original intent. But covetousness is a sin placed within our mind by the devil, and his plan is simple. And you all have heard me say it. And you need to memorize this in some way, fashion, shape, or form. Sin takes you further than you ever intended to go. It holds you longer than you ever intended to stay. And it's going to cost you far more than you ever intended to pay. You didn't intend for it to happen. But if you don't set the priorities, and if you don't watch out, if you don't have the Word of God within your heart, how can a young man keep his way pure? By following your commands, by obeying them. I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against God. The word of God is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. It will show me so I don't trip up and end up where I never intended to be. Staying as long as I ended up having to stay and paying far more than I ever intended to pay. It all starts in the mind. Just a little thought. James 1.15 gives us the progression of sin. It starts first here. Then you dwell on it. And then it becomes action, which Jesus already warned us about, and it leads to death. So we need to teach our children to seek God first, above everything, to be content with what He gives us to handle. And there's nothing that will kill a covetous heart deader than 
learning to give. Becoming a giver. I love this. And then I'll end here. The United States congressman sat down with his preacher for a visit. A U.S. congressman. He said, listen, pastor, I'm going to tell you what God has taught me about giving. I took my son to McDonald's the other day, and my son wanted a large order of French fries. So we were spending some father-son time together, so I bought that large order of French fries, and I sat it there in front of my son. As we were sitting there and talking a little bit, I reached across the table to get just a couple of those fries, and my son put his hand on mine and said, no, these are mine. Get yourself some if you want some, Dad. Pastor, that just went right through me, he said. In a flash, God spoke to my heart, and he gave me one of the greatest lessons of stewardship I have ever learned. Listen to this, he said. Number one, I thought three things about my son. Number one, he evidently had forgotten where those french fries had come from. I'm the person who bought them for him. Number two, he has failed to recognize that I have the power to take them all from him if I want to. In fact, I have the ability to go buy 20 more large orders of french fries and bury him in them if I want to. My son has an attitude problem. If I wanted more fries for myself, I've got the money to go up and buy them and then sit at another table and eat them all by myself. And then, do you know what my God said to me, Pastor? He said, you know what, that's the very same attitude you have with me sometimes, sir. You need to remember where all your blessings came from in the first place. I'm the one who gave you these things. I have the power to take them from you or to give you more. And last of all, you need to understand something. I don't need your french fries. Listen this morning, God doesn't need anything including us and what we have. We need him. You and I need him. And how wonderful it is to have fellowship with him and to say, Lord, it's a pleasure to give back to you out of all that you've given to us. And the blessing continues as we become like our father and give to others. Does that make sense? Try to make it as simple as possible. We become like him when we give to others. Teach your children to give because nothing destroys a covetous spirit like a giving heart. And you know what the most precious and sweetest children are those who give. Those who are giving instead of saying, mine! They're the ones who give. They're the ones who yield whenever somebody else comes to them and says, that's my toy. Okay. They back off. And you look at that and who are you going to have a little more fond heart for? The child who said, mine? Or the child who went, okay. Which child do you want to be yours? There. That's God's top ten. And he designed them for our benefit. He designed those ten commandments to bring health and happiness to you, to your home. Pass them on to your children. Pass them on to your grandchildren. Whether your, your own children are passing them on to their kids or not, grandparents, Fill the gap if that's what it's going to take. You pass them on. Whisper them in their ears. Encourage them. And you'll never be sorry. As Will's getting ready to play, I want to ask you a question. Do you know Jesus? I don't mean do you just know who Jesus is. Do you know him? See, I had, I had a conversation with him this morning. Many of you probably did too. He's real. He's a real person. And oh, as we've sung today, how he loves you. He loves you so much, he proved it. In heaven, in glory, angels at his beck and call, sinless, a whole sinless area. I mean, not, nothing sinful tainting that heaven. And he, he looked down and he saw your condition. He saw your sinful heart, your sinful attitude. He saw the things that you were doing, what you were being involved in, what it was doing to you. And he loved you so much in spite of that. He left heaven. He limited himself by allowing himself to become a sinful man like you and me. He showed us how to live. And then wrongfully accused of doing wrong, which he had never done, he went to the cross and paid the debt that you and I owe for our sin. We can never go to heaven on our own. He paid that debt so that we could. 
that sign shows there's no way I can walk into heaven on my own. Jesus covered that with his own blood. And you and I get to go in if we trust him as our Savior and Lord. His blood covers our sins. That is the only way you and I ever get to go into heaven. Do you know Jesus? Have a relationship with him? That's what this is all about. That's how important it is. It's the most important thing in the world. More important than who you're going to marry. More important than where you're going to go to school. If you're going to go to school, what you do for a living is what you do with Jesus first. He enhances all the rest of that if you'll let him into your life. If you need to know Christ today or you're not certain that you do and you want to know, I'm going to encourage you to pray with me right now. Many of you have prayed this prayer many times. It only takes one time meaning it. One time to adopt you into the family of God. I'm going to ask that you bow your heads right now where you're at. Everybody in the room, nobody looking around, and pray with me. And those of you that know Christ, you pray with all your power that God's Spirit helps us close this service properly today. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I know it. I've messed up. I've done many things in my life that are wrong. My thought life isn't what it should be. Lord, forgive me of my sin. I believe you died for my sin, for my mistakes. And I believe, Lord, that you proved you were who you said you were when you rose again on the third day. Nobody else ever did that for me. Lord, I believe you did that. Come into my life. Help me to live for you. Give me a home in heaven someday. Help me to get involved in this church family. Your son, Jesus' name. Amen.